Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come before you and we have asked you to plant our feet on higher ground. And you've asked us to come up to a higher ground because you're seeking to prepare a body of believers that will stand on the highest ground on this earth, thus witnessed by mankind and the heavenly force. You're calling us to the highest standard, sinless perfection of character, a character that will be maintained or severely tried to the uttermost. You told us in your word that it will require a faith to endure weariness, hunger, and delay, and you're taking us daily through these tests and trials. Grant us the faith to believe your word and the courage to stand firm under every test and trial that our character will be purified and sanctified on perfection and that will be raised from one level of sanctification to another until we reach that higher ground that you've set for us and outlined before us and given us an example in Christ that we can attain to it. Teach us now as we study your word and let your spirit indeed be our teacher and our guide that we will believe and receive your word and allow that word to sanctify us unto perfection we pray in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. All right, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome back to our afternoon session. We are continuing. I look at the 144,000 and the calling of God's people to produce that body of believers. We spent our last study looking at Melchizedek, who was the type of Christ. Christ was made after the order of Melchizedek, but Christ was before Melchizedek. That order and that priesthood was before the priesthood of Christ on this earth. And Paul asked the question, if Perfection whereby the Levitical priesthood, what need shall there be that another priest should arise and not be called after the order of Aaron? Because that was the type. Alright, that was the type. Therefore, the one that Christ was made after would have to be the anti type, the reality. The Lord had a man upon the earth at that time through whom he could reveal his glory. Power, majesty, wisdom, and love, and vindicate his character the government before the accuser of the brother Satan and before the universe. He has done it here and there. You know, was translated without seeing death. Moses was resurrected, even though he mismanaged on the borders of the promised land. Elijah was translated. The three Hebrew boys remained faithful in the midst of the fiery furnace. Daniel remain faithful in the midst of the trap of the death by lions and the Lord is now looking to gather a large body of believers 144,000 a number but it does not mean that that is a literal number he needs to have more more than one individual here and there to say this to that he has to vindicate his character in the government and he needs a convincing evidence when he has that large number of believers every question in the line thank you every question in the long standing controversy will be answered because Satan will say well, those are just here and there by the way one two one here one there can you do it through a generation and the Lord said yes I'm gonna do it and we're gonna answer you it is not only for Satan is for the security of the universe to demonstrate that God did not establish any principles or government or operations that could not be complied with by all of his intelligent creatures. When you can find and take the worst in the universe, and that's what we are we say for the moment, we're the worst creatures in God's universe, the most bad behavior. Sometimes not even devils. Sometimes the devils probably wonder how it is that we get so bad behavior. But we do things that the devil don't do. The wonder how we get so bad. God came to his own, his own people with his own culture 
and their genes right through that line and they were bent on killing him day after day the devil came to jesus for 40 days and when jesus finished with him he left and gave jesus a break pharisees did not give him a break every sabbath after sabbath they saw him when they were there they sent spies to tribute his words hear what he said so they could condemn him to death devils don't behave like us sometimes and the most barbarian people are profess christians right Hey, the problem, you know, if the devil sees things, just right now, Bobby, you going on? Or if the devil sees things, just right now, human beings will continue in that body and he introduced it, and he went on. Sin is still there. and that's what God wants to remove from us. The principle of sin, the sympathy with Satan. And once those principles are eradicated, then his people will be fixed and finished in chapter. All right, we spent the last study looking at Melchizedek. And we're going to look at, now, we, we're going to look at Isaac, and we're going to look at Jacob, beginning to there, and we're just going laying the foundation of going back to the beginning, because many people jump into Revelation 7, and run along with what they know, many without going back to the beginning. The best place to start anything is where? The beginning. So we go back to Jacob. And his twelve children, who will comprise the hundred and forty-four thousand, the hundred forty-four thousand will be comprised from the twelve tribes of Israel. And before we are finished, we're done. We're going to establish who Israel really is, in order to be able to correctly understand that we must establish who Israel is, because the majority of the religious world still believe that Israel is up there in the Middle East. When people tell you that you must know which tribe you belong to in order to be a part, it has nothing to do with that. All right? And we need to have a solid foundation because if we don't, then we're going to be um, up to sea. I, I don't want to go into all of the, the details of, most of these you know already, I don't want to go into all of the details of that, but we're going to just highlight something now. We were dealt with Isaac's birth already. Remember when we were dealt with Sarah, or Sarah, Abraham, Hagar, Ishmael. And we looked at the two covenants and righteousness by faith and righteousness by works. When the Lord said to Abraham, I will give you a son, he meant through his wife. And he doubted it because the promise delayed and worked up his own thing. He and Sarah, as we saw this morning, made plans for the work of God. The Lord seems to have forgotten the promise. He didn't know, he didn't realize that I am barren and you're not old. So we have to, and that was the church board and right now the church committee. Two members. And they come up with a plan, put it in operation and proceeded on to do the work of God and create problems that the church, the world, not only the church, but the world still have the effects of those problems because when Ishmael was born, out of him came Iraq and Syria and all those and out of Isaac came Israel and those two nations are fighting up to today. So when the church when the church mismanages, it does not only affect the church, it affects the work of God and the world at large. Mismanaging their problems. Alright, so the, the message there is when we obey God, it says Abraham believed God, Genesis 15, 1 to 6. And it was counted to him for righteousness. Righteousness by faith then is simple as believing the word of God, accepting it, and it is right. God said, Abraham, you're right. Because God was right. Anytime you agree with God, you can't be wrong. And he held on to that for a period of time. Then his faith, wherever he doubted, and they came up with a plan for the God's work and cause God's work to stumble. Now when Isaac was born, and I introduced the top topic of divorce, I got nothing but links. Yeah. Anyhow, we'll get back to that another time. My worry. We'll get back to that another time. Holy peace. 
I mean, for this is the great controversy, you know, and the controversy will not be finished. The great controversy will not be finished without small controversy. I know, very All right, I introduced that, but we'll deal with that at another time because we, as a people, we've come along with a lot of things that are cultural, denominational, and not question them. If we don't question them now, listen, lawyers, we'll be ready to defend our position. Of course, lawyers are going to pick apart your position. Lawyers are, are specialists at picking apart your position to get you tripped up and say what. You, you really don't believe. A lawyer stood up and asked Jesus a question, and the Bible says, intending to do a triple up. The lawyer comes to Jesus and says, He asked to find you if he comes to trip up Jesus, and Jesus put the question back in his in his court to answer. He answered it himself. And then he asked, What can I laugh at? You see, he really said that you keep you don't keep the commandments in. But if the commandments were in your heart, you would have been living the life. But they will come with trick questions to try and get you. I remember Elder Doug gave an example once. Uh, he's a doctor, a medical practitioner, and this guy got cut at something. He was a doctor that attended the physicians and stitched it up, etc. Gone to court, and the lawyer asked him, What kind of instrument did he get? To? I'm not sure he did. He got cut with a bottle. Are you sure it was this kind of body? The judge said, Listen, judge said, Listen, this young man is a busy man, has things to do. Go along with the business and go do the, the work that the government gives you. Lawyer asking, oh, then if we strike the man got cut and see you did, and you wonder if it was a straight instrument, a jagged piece of blade, this, what kind of ball it was. What I got to do with the case? Just asking questions to get you tripped up. You just say, listen, this young man is busy, he got work to do. Go in the hospital and do what you got to do. Then go stand. Bring something of substance. When lawyers will come, our positions are going to be questioned, and we have to know them. So if we do all a position, know you. Lawyers will go and study your biblical position just to win the case. They're not studying to learn to, so they'll be picking it apart to cause you to be tripped up and to fall. So we have to examine every position. We'll get back to that at another time in terms of divorce because it caused. All right. Abraham and Isaac. Abraham and Sarah. They brought forth the son. Then, well, he around here, girl, and she mocked when she saw she conceived, and Sarah was not conceiving. And then, 13 years later, 13 is the number of rebellion. Remember, we looked at that 12 years that served Chapel in the 13th year, the rebel in the 14th year, they came and brought them back in to subjection. And these numbers will come into play by the time we are finished. 12 is the kingdom subject number they served, submitted. The 13th year, they rebelled. In the 14th year, came and brought them back in. 14 is the number for redemption. 13 rebelled and 12 submission. So it is 12 tribes, and all those who be composed of it will be all that number. Those who are submitted to the Lord, to serve the Lord, will make up the 144,000. Remember that 144 is 12 times 12. Or 12. All right? Multiply by 12. 12. All right, now, verse chapter 24, Genesis. Just the introduction, and this is to show when we're dealing with God, if we are willing, we will read this morning, if we are willing to know and to do the will of God and to follow it, God will guide his children. We're going to read verses 1 to 14 responsibly, Genesis 24. I begin, and Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son, of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. Unto my country, and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, For adventure the woman will not be willing to follow me into this land, must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from my thou camest? And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou bring not my son thither again. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house, and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land, he shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. 
times a woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my hope. Only bring up my son hither again. And the servant put his hand on the thigh of Abraham his master and swear to him concerning the matter. And the servant took ten camel of the camel of his master and departed, for all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesmetalia, unto the city of Nahor. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day, and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of the water, and the daughters of the men of the city came up to draw water. Pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for my servant Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. Now I'm going to read verse 15, and I'm going to ask you a question. And it came to pass, before he had done speaking, that behold, Rebekah came out, who was born of Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nehor, Abraham's brother, with her picture upon her shoulder. Now, he, before he had done speaking, where is that promise from? from? If I quote the text for you, you should know. No. Where is that promise found? <clears throat> and it came to pass before he had done speaking. And it shall come to pass that before you call, I will answer, and while you are yet speaking, I will hear. Where is that from? Isaiah, Isaiah 65, 20. Isaiah, it's in Isaiah. This is smart to get at least two points for the book. Yeah, this is in Isaiah. This is smart? I'm sure it is in Isaiah. He sure is in Isaiah. 24, 65, 24. Smart in name, smart in answer. Here the promise is now, it is written by Isaiah, but it is a principle inside God because every single problem or difficulty that God's people have, God already has a solution for. Yeah. Isaiah 64, 65. 20, 65, 24. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will yeah. hear. So, 65, 24. I, I claim that promise. You claim that promise? Yes. Hallelujah. It was answered? Yes. All the time. Now, this is Isaiah writing. Jeremiah. 33. Jeremiah 33. Jeremiah 33. Three. Yeah. Jeremiah 33 speaks of asking God of. I'm sure the great and marvelous things which thou knowest not. Yeah. But three. Jeremiah 33, verse 3. See the living? And this was one of 33 verse 3. It, it is part of the principle, but this text is not one to apply here. It can be applied. But I like this text for the latter part of it. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Whenever I find myself in a difficulty concerning the word of God, this is the promise I bring to the Lord. I want an answer on this matter. All right, and that's the promise. I will show you great and marvelous things which thou knowest not. It's Jeremiah 33, verses 3. Now, back to Genesis 24. Now, this is to show that when we pray under the Spirit of God, and Paul says in Romans 8, verses 26, it is the Spirit that gives us. Uh -huh. Utterance with things that we cannot be understood. Grown is understand. When we are in connection with God, the Spirit will prompt and direct the prayers. And so when you are praying in accordance with the mind of God, you cannot but get an answer Amen. to that prayer. Because you're praying in harmony with the will of God, it is our faith, and it will be answered. This servant had asked the Lord for direction. The man knew his master Abraham, and he knew his master's God. And he trusted him, I want directions because you know I have a serious responsibility and this is concerning your work. Before the man had done praying, the answer to her prayer was there and she filled in every specification. Just go to verse, I read verse 15. 
Verse 16, and the, the damsel was very fair to look upon. A virgin neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitch and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she hastened to let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy channels also until they have done drinking. God knew her mind. And his prayer was in accordance with her mind and personality, the kind of person that she was. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again onto the well to draw water and drew well for his candles. And this is a total stranger, you know, a man you never meet before. And he didn't have a yeah? he, he didn't draw a pitcher. That was part of the way the culture of things back then. The women would do those kind of domestic responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Verse 20. Verse 21, sorry. And the man wondering at her held his peace. To wait whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. Can't believe it. So fast. You, 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 you can't tell me just done prayer and the prayer fulfiller. Mm -hmm. Held his peace, wanting to know whether or not the Lord had answered his prayer. And sometimes that's how we are. You pray for something, the answer comes and you pray. So quick. So and you don't. Nice. Which shows a, a lack of faith on our part. This is something that Christ did not do when he spoke in full confidence and it was done. When we speak in faith, God will do likewise. Mm -hmm. He wondered whether or not it can, it can be so. Or it can be real. So quickly, prayer already answered because it, it, it was of the Lord. And it came to pass, verse 22, we move on. It came to pass, the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring and half a shekel weight of two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold. And said, Whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee, is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge? Right down to the teeth. Right down to the teeth. Exactly from Aaron's house. Now, Aaron said to his servant, Do not take my son back to Babylon. The Lord had called him out, and he knew he was not to go back to Babylon. Don't take my son back there by any cause. If you go there and the Lord don't give you fear, you are free from the oath. You are no longer accountable. But don't go back to where the Lord called me from. And that is a lesson that we have to go, learn, not to go back to where the Lord has delivered us from. Israel's problem was they wanted to do what? Go back into Egypt. Back into Egypt, and that's why they suffered in the wilderness because their hearts, the Lord was taking them from there to the promised land, and their minds were to go back into Egypt where they were. The road to the promised land is going to be difficult because it is the process of sanctification that the Lord is taking us through. God does not take us through difficulties because he has nothing else to do or he's being spiteful of me. He's showing us ourselves. He said to them in, uh, in Deuteronomy 8 verse 3, The Lord led thee these 40 years in the wilderness and fed thee with manna which thou knowest not, that thou mightest know what was in thy heart. He led them through there to let them see what was in their heart. And all that the Lord is leading us through is to let us see what? What is in our heart. Pardon I, I, I think that's where. Do you know what I mean, Adrian? I think that's where it says that. Um, let, me, let me make sure. Yes, I think it's Deuteronomy. Uh, Adrian Moses was speaking. Oh, yes. No, no, no. Yes, Deuteronomy 8 to 3. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God hath led thee these 40 years in the wilderness okay. to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or not. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So it was a, an experience for them to see what was in their heart that could not go to the promised land, so he had to come out during the wilderness wandering. And Jesus taught this to them. And when he was here in human form, in the wilderness, he remembered the words that he taught the children of Israel and said to the, the enemy, Man shall not live by bread alone. So the lessons that the Lord taught to them, he himself practiced when he took on human form and nature. All right, back to Genesis. And the prayer for the advancement of the work of God, which is from God, will be heard. It was given and it was answered so quickly that the servant began to question me. You mean to tell me be, the Lord is so fast? And this is something that we have to believe that when God does a thing, He does it immediately. 
when it answers when we are praying for the advancement of the work of God we can rest assured that the Lord will answer that prayer immediately many times when we pray we get a delay to the answer check and see if we are praying for is not something that is not going to hinder the work of God or be a stumbling block when it comes to sin and the advancing of God's work when it comes to the work of God and stuff the answers come speedily all right the servant trusted the Lord and the Lord gave him good speed the rest of the story in here goes into detail you don't have to go into all these details you know the story just highlighting these points you want to get to Jacob and I mentioned that so that we can learn to know when we're dealing with God's work he has it at heart and will provide the means for his advancement now verse same verses 61 So we're going to read from verses 61 to 67. Genesis 24, 61, Genesis 24, 61 to 67, responsibly they begin. And Rebecca rose and her damsels, and they rode upon camels, and followed the man. And the servant took Rebecca and went his way. And Isaac came from the way of the man of the Lord, for he dwelt in his And Isaac went up to meditate in the field at even time, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. For she had said unto the servant, What man is that that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. Together. And Isaac brought her into his mother's tent and took Rebecca. She became his wife and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. <laughs> yes, it's the rubber. You make you keep it up here? No, 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 see? That is, you know, you know, you know, is what we create. You understand? Sermon is what we create. This is the divine art. And now, if I tell you all, I went, I go into California and I go out and meet a woman, first time I'm married, you all just say, the elder Lucy. I know you was a model, but let me see. You all say, the elder Lucy. I know you was a model, but let me see. Now, here you have divine working all right the man prayed the lord answered the prayer according to his request because he wanted to do the will of god rebecca ne never laid eyes on isaac isaac never laid eyes on rebecca but they were both children of god and the marriage was a match made in heaven as we would say now if this subject is always touching anyway if the Lord picks a woman for you or a man for you, can that be the wrong person? No. If the Lord picks a woman for you, can she be can she be not your taste? Yeah, you see how you hesitate now? You see how you see how you hesitate now? <laughs> but you, you answer anybody, you answer willingly. Now people say yes, brother. And when I ask you, she's it's called you. But she or he, according to your case, people hesitate enough. Lord, one second. When it is of the Lord, don't question and say whether or not you're going to like her. God knows you better than you. So you can't pick somebody for you that you are not going to know what is not to your case. But we are afraid to leave it with God we read this morning. We are afraid of the consequences that such a surrender may involve. If we really trust the Lord, we have how much to fear? Nothing. 
Make these is two children of God with you. You look at her and say, well, this young man was a child of promise. And Abraham was one of the better Christian children throughout the entire Bible. Isaac was one of the better Christian children throughout the entire Bible. Page 1920. Lord said, still be going to offer sacrifice to the Lord. Ox. Uh, ass, wood, fire, no lamb. Really lamb, the Lord will provide the lamb. Get up on him up. Uh, really lamb. Sorry to tell you somebody, Lord tell me you are all <laughs> No, no. She said for a moment he was horrified. But then he accepted it and encouraged his father to bind his hands and to cut his throat. Now you go tell the average 20 year old and the father tell me you talking there. At 19 or 20, he will at least say about it. He gave a ram or he fall and throw him in the dog and run. Ready to run and fight. And this for the child that was converted and sacrificed and was willing to accept that the Lord wanted him as a sacrifice and encouraged his father to do it. He can't even get to the Now here's the contract I read about the black flag and only that you can kill it. His sanctification was from his very birth and he reached a high level so that when his herd men, he did go well, and fathers come and strive with it move when they were another. They come and strive with that, move when they were another. His Christianity was practical and demonstrated as a witness to the universe. Holy question. Alright? No. So the match was made in heaven. And you don't have to, we should not be questioning God. He knows what he is doing. He knows us better than we know ourselves, and the sooner we get to believe that, the better it will be for us. Too often we second guess. God, we are afraid to trust God. Abraham, Isaac had no doubt, and Rebecca had no doubt. When the servant outlined out his prayer and how things worked out, they said, It is of the Lord, we can't go for it. Let her go. And she came from her land to a strange land to a man she never laid eyes on and got married to that man. One of the better marriages, too. One of the better marriages. But we ain't going into that now too much. Whenever marriage is mentioned here, it's trouble in the camp. Chapter 25, go over to verse 19. And we're going to read from verse 19 to 34 responsibly. These are the generations of Isaac. Abraham's son, Abraham begat Isaac. And Isaac was four years old when he took the hands of his wife. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord had, was entreated of him, and Rebekah his wife conceived. And the children struggled together with anger, and said, They could be so violently and she went to inquire. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy olive, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And the first came up red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came the first time, and the hands of and his name was Saul Jacob. And the boys grew, and the Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man, dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau, because he did eat of the but Rebecca loved Jacob. And Jacob sought pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, He made a drink, and that and Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Jacob said, Swear to me this day, and he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. And Jacob gave his saw bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink, and rose up and went his way. Thus he saw despise his birthright. Thus he saw despise his birthright. Now Isaac was forty years when he got married, 
and the children were born when he was 60. So 20 years passed between the marriage and the birth of his sons. And it is shown us here that she apparently was also barren like Sarah. And we see this barrenness developing after the flood, after the degeneration of the race, and after the death of man has changed. It is affecting the reproductive system of both men and women. So a lot of the problems that we have today are dietary related. And we have to bear that in mind. God, when made mankind, said be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and no such thing existed before the flood. There was no such thing as barrenness. But it is showing us also that natural impossibilities cannot hinder the work of God. And this is the lesson the Lord wants us to, to, to remember. Isaac was born in response to the prayer of faith. And Paul picks it up and says, Sarah, when her faith got to a certain level, we see strength to conceive. So the problem all along was not simply the barrenness, but her lack of faith in God. When she believed, and even when the Lord said it, you can have a child next year, she laughed. How many men is work? Doubted, and Paul says she had to get to that level of faith to believe that God could cause her to conceive, to put life where death was. These natural impossibilities do not interfere with God's work. The problem always is lack of faith on the part of God's people. If we have faith, faith, Jesus said, nothing shall be impossible to you. Natural human impossibilities cannot hinder the work of God. The greatest hindrance is a lack of faith on the part of God's people. Now then, when she conceived and the twins struggled within her, she went to inquire of the Lord. Do we inquire of the Lord or do we find other means and ways to go? She went and inquired of the Lord. The Lord gave her a device on the ground that not only told her who was there. The Lord said, two nations are here. And the elder will serve the younger, contrary to culture. All right? And sadly, Jacob did not allow the Lord to reveal how he would have achieved that. He decided, once again, to bring human planning and devising into the work of God and cause problems again. And the mother would have said to him, listen, do what I tell you. The Lord told me before you were even born, you were just kicking around in my tummy, that you are going to be the one to rule. The elder is going to serve you. So do what I tell you. And he, his conscience bothered him, knowing what he was doing was wrong, but he went along with it. So even when we have the word of God, we are not to use the word of God deceitfully. All right? So she was using that word that the Lord said, the elegant served the younger in a deceitful way because she was asking Jacob to go alike. She was telling Jacob, go and like pretend to be who you are not. And it caused problems. He succeeded in getting the birthright, but he had to run from his home. He never saw his mother again. That was the price he paid for that deception. He never saw her alive again. Ran over to the, back to the same uncle where his mother came from, who turned out to be as much Jacob as he was, and deceived him for the next 20 years. And he vexed and complained, and he, you don't understand, I worked seven years for one wife, and he gave me another one, and I worked for seven years, and he sleep at my eyes, and he drew at night, and he sat in the day, and any loss that can't, I took responsibility, and now you come, run shack in my house, and tell me about my children, scary gods, and all this kind of thing. If he had not run, if he had not deceived his father, now you see how cause and effect, he deceived his father and run. If he had not done that, he would not be here. But all of these behaviors, we're going to see that they don't interfere with the purpose of God because God will achieve his purpose through any circumstance that we can create. His, his infinite wisdom and foreknowledge allows him to look down and see that he can achieve his purpose without violating the freedom of choice of any of his creatures. We cannot do anything but that God knows about it and it cannot frustrate God's cause. We can cause quote-unquote delays because we will make a course go the wrong way, but once we trust God, he will still and can correct it. He obtained the birthright by fraud, robbed us of an opportunity to see how the Lord would have done it, and robbed God of an opportunity to work through him. If he had not done it that way, we would have seen then how God would have achieved his purpose without 
any deception and to overrule in culture to reveal that his word is not subject to culture. And that's one of the things we have to learn because too often human beings try to bring God and his word down to their cultural positions and beliefs. When it comes to the work of God, all of those things are non-existent and irrelevant. We must learn that by the time we get to Christ's time. So he got the birthright by fraud and he left. He ran away from there, went over to his uncle and suffered deception at the hand of his uncle. Do not use Satan's methods to achieve God's purposes. It's an insult to God. Amen. And as, 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 as what we describe it, it's a tribute to his satanic majesty. Mm -hmm. Whenever the people of God resort to Satan's methods mm -hmm. to further God's work, Satan look at God and said, not even your people mm -hmm. ain't trusting your methods. Can't be the right. It's no good. So if we offer insult to God, when we leave infinite wisdom yes. and go to the source of darkness to use Satan's methods of deception and dishonesty to advance God's work. God don't need it. It means we lack faith in God and are dependent upon ourselves. And they always create more problems than they alleviate. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to go into all the details. You know these stories and you can get, get them at your time. You want to go to Jacob and his children because this is where we begin to look at the 12 tribes of Israel, the foundation where they're coming, and then we will get down to Revelation. Then when we have the foundation, we can build a good building as we go on. In, in Jacob meeting, Rachel is the reverse of Isaac meeting, uh, Abraham's servant, Eliezer meeting, Rebecca. He said, let the woman that gives me water and water the camel be the one. In the case of Jacob, he's the one that did water for Rachel. Because at that time, the men would come in and she being a woman would have to wait one side to the last and would take long to water because the men would dominate and she would have to wait. So when Jacob came, he stood up for her and prevented them, watered her camels, and she got home early for her. Said, oh, you got home early? Well, they met this man at the well that defended me, so to speak. And I'm going, oh, where's the man? You left him up there? And then when he come up from, well, this is my kinsman. Come in and work for me. He said he wanted, I want that girl for my wife. What do you want? I mean, give you seven years. Seven years. Yes, what, work in seven years? Yeah, the men have to learn. You guys want to work or come up with something? That was principle, that was culture. That was culture. So at least we have some things. You would know, and it had some benefits in it. Um, it had some benefits in it because it would prove whether the man was worth white or if he was just a, a scam and a low life and a, as you see here in America, a deadbeat father who has no good intentions or no willingness or ability to take care of his family. What he was proving to Levan that he was dead serious and he was willing to and capable of taking care of his daughter. When you give her to me, you don't have to worry about it. And so there was some benefit in it. He was willing to work. Yes. Hmm? Yes. I was just going to say, Sister White says that um, at least two years should pass in a court for your. Um, well, when you when you engage. Before, uh, yes, and six months before you actually get married. Now let me ask you. I got married a year after. Let me ask you. Was that two years? When you said six months? In engagement. She said six months in engagement. If God oh. show me, I mean the yes, next yes, day yes. I can be married. <laughs> but a Coco said God show you the next day you can get married. Now the thing is but that's true, brother clearly. Listen, that is true. The thing is do we have a good enough connection with God to know that it is the will of God? Because often we say the Lord said the Lord has not said anything. We come like Samson and say she pleases me well, get her for me. And he got her 
And then last, a month. Yeah, so Libya, going back home, come back, find out if I'm ready. I went to the apple cart, I've turned and be like, the woman don't give us to me. <laughs> you know, apple cart, because it's, it's, it's a lemon cart, but you feel it's out. <laughs> and we then start them now. It is very easy to say the Lord have said when the Lord have not said. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the heart is deceitful of all things and yeah. desperately we gave wicked. Our heart to so when we see somebody that we like, the Lord has told me, you are my wife. He ain't tell me that yet. So, mm -hmm. so she had it from the Lord. If that's what you said, the Lord said it. All these things falling into place. I will go. The servant asked the Lord. Mm -hmm. And the Lord answered the prayer mm -hmm. directly. Exactly. But she had to believe that it was of the Lord because she didn't have any directives like that, like the servant had. Yes, but he asked and prayed, and everything that he prayed for fell into play. She didn't leave home intended to meet her, her husband, so did he go to water her father camps? Yeah, I guess they would have to know because it makes money. <laughs> um, it's still on that point, uh, verse 14 of chapter 24. When it says that um, that that woman was supposed to be the servant, um, isn't that and that you have said it's got a point in way, but in our culture we see then that um, it's the man who's supposed to be the provider and be the servant. So uh, is that saying that we have deviated from God's way of how one should do the work. One should function as husband and wife, especially in line of God's work. Because um, one, the, the, the woman is supposed to be servant. And again, back in Paul, I, I think it's Paul, it's on um, the Corinthians. When it says that the woman was chosen for the man. So if that is so, then the woman is supposed to be the servant and be, be making sure that the, the, the man's needs are catered for. And you know, my sister. I, 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 I think that she's got a chance to finish because I am getting from what was said in the situation with Jacob that the woman was supposed to be catering to the man. And, to, and I saw it in Paul. I saw it in Paul again. And I am getting it that and it is not too late, sister, if we I've gone down the wrong path to make that turn around <laughs> to say if that is why the Lord is saying this is why I'm yoking you up with this man to have it. And I think that we are seeing that in the degrading light that when a woman caters to a man, it's something subservient. And I think more that we need to see something beyond subservience and see that we are really as with um, the situation here with Rebecca that she was serving God's servant and doing God's will. All right, hold a second, hold a second. Don't run out. That's why you said, I know, open this door to these questions because you know, whenever the subject comes up, you all just start running. All right. Yeah, especially you. What I don't like that whole submissive thing. I'm sorry. Uh, listen, listen, listen. We are not dealing with marriage, and there's nothing wrong in submission if you have the right mind. Submission is the very principle in the Godhead. Yes. The Son is subject to the Father. The Father is subject to the Son, and both are subject to the Spirit of God, which is the love of God. When love is the bond, there is no problem with submission. Don't take submission out of context. Okay? And we ain't, we, we ain't going into marriage now. All right? One second. Listen. No, I'm not. Y'all are the ones who open up the be dealing with the, with the 144,000. By all means, it must come in. If, listen, if 
the marriage is of God. He has made the choice. You will have no problems. Exactly. You have no problems. There, if there is no submission, nothing in the universe can work. The very principle. One second. The, the very principle upon which the universe is founded is a submission of power to wisdom, wisdom to power, and the principle is love. And that is what allowed all of the universe to be created. When it comes then to marriage, there is to be that submission. There is too much rebellion in everything in this universe because of extremes and excess on one hand, and they are going to extremes and excess on the other. But since we are reformation, we will deal with reform principles and we will come back to that another time. Can we get back to Jacob? <laughs> you, you started it, Sister Alex. You don't want things started the problem, huh? I was just going to say, you know, if, 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 if um, as you rightly said, if it's God's uh, choice when you have the problem of something, but oh my goodness, I'm talking from experience. I want you to feel like a slave in your home. That is because, I feel my because, sister, thank you. because, because the man that you had was not chosen by God yes, and he needed to be converted. All right. He needed to be converted. All right. He needed to be converted. One and two. In a male dominated world, men have taken the word of God out of context and use it to their advantage and the disadvantage of women. God said to he you deserve beyond your husband and he rule over you. That didn't mean Adam became a child. Adam was one of the most gentle persons on the planet. He even had no problem with Adam being her, her husband. Men took that in the Jewish culture and went to extremes so that women were not even recognized as uh, human. And if she didn't get any children, put you on side and get another woman and get children from her. She couldn't say anything about it. That was not the divine order. The principle is God is no respecter of persons. And in his eyes, all of us are equal. But there are rules in the family because there can be no family without the genders. Male and female, there is no male or female. How is they going to be reproduction? And God did not. God did not dictate that any one of you here was going to be a woman. He knew that you were going to be female. He knew that I was going to be female, but he did not dictate that and direct that. Direct that. that is the quote unquote law of the draw in terms of the reproductive process. But he did not sit down and say, but I'm going to make Sister Paul a woman. I'm going to step out a man. No, that is the result of the reproductive process within the framework of how things work out, time and chance, what particular time, when your father went into your mother, that determined what happened. If it was two days later, you will be here. Two or three days later, you will be here to somebody else. So it's not God's dictation. That is the order of being that he created, and you need to have both genders in order to have reproduction. All right, so there's nothing wrong in your gender, and there's nothing to grin about it. That is the problem of sin that has to be gotten rid of from the minds of the people of God to understand God's purpose. And when you pleasure, you're saying, yeah, when there is no people to see yourself as a but no, there's not submitted to your husband is being in the You don't love Christ. You don't love Christ. You don't love Christ. What? Judah. You love Christ? Judah? Yeah. Judah? What do you mean Judah? Judah, the disciple, he loved Christ. Judas? Yeah. Uh, I I don't know to what extent. Okay. But as Christ served him, and yes. that's why he said. Yes. The first, the first thing to be watched for Judas is people. So, if Christianity is to have the very spirit of Christ, God can keep you in any adversity and overrule the situation, take that to form your character. Any retaliation not from God? No, no retaliation from God. That's the spirit of rebellion. And in God's people, it will be eradicated. Alright? If there is no submission, there can be no union. That exists inside God. You must learn that and apply it. All right, let us get to Jacob and his... 
and his wife and the children that he produced. Yes, we can deal with marriage another time. All right? No, I can't tell you next. We'll deal with marriage the next time. Now Genesis 29. Verses 15, Genesis 29, 15, and we're going to read down to verse 35 responsibly. We're looking, at, we're looking for the 12 tribes in the beginning, and we'll go down to the end. Genesis 29, verse 15, responsibly I begin to the end. And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, should thou therefore serve me for not? Tell me what that shall be thy wages. Leah was tender eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well favored. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years of Rachel and younger daughter. said, It is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man, abide with me. And Jacob loved Rachel and received her to him in her and Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I might go in unto her. And Laban gathered together all men and made a feast. It came to pass in the evening that he took Leah his daughter and brought her to him, and he went in unto her. And Laban gave unto his daughter Leah's daughter, And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah, and he said unto Laban, He said to Laban, What is this that thou hast done? Unto me, did not I serve thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? And they never said, It must not be so done in all countries, even young girls. Fulfill her week, and he will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. And Jacob said, I will give him Rachel to his daughter to also. And Laban gave to Rachel his daughter Lilla, his handmaid, to be her maid. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was born. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this also. And she called his name Simeon. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Now will I praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. And she conceived again and bare a son and she said, Now will I praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah and left. There. Now, here, here in the Word of God, you see Jacob getting beguiled or tricked by his uncle, and that was the result of him beguiling and tricking his father and running away, ending up someplace where, in the providence of God, it would not have been. Now, we can say a providence, but it was not necessarily the will of God for him to be deceptive and perhaps to run away. And things to work out the way how they did. Because something has worked out, we does not mean that that is God's will. His providence and his foreknowledge must go along with what we choose to do, and God will still achieve his purpose through it. So Leah was the first wife, even though by deception, and she conceived four sons. Now the Bible says here, and the Lord, where the Lord saw Leah was here, verse 31, you open her home where she was born. God did not open her womb because she was hit. Mm -hmm. She was fruitful. Rachel had a problem with her reproductive organs. So don't read the words here and say that God looked down and said that she was hated and blessed her and the other one was cursed. No. Pardon? No, verse 31. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barked. That is not ambitious. This is 
us understanding the words of the scripture. To bring, to make a husband love his wife. No, you. That's what I'm explaining. That when we read the words in the Bible, we must understand the principles. It was not that God opened up her womb and closed ratios. God does not operate like that. This is the result of the same problem. But this is how Bible writers will write it. Bible language. God did not do anything of that sort. Now, chapter 30. But that was culture. They need to be gotten rid of. Alright, we're gonna write, we're gonna read on to verse 24 of chapter 30. Responsibly. And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel did envy their sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. And she said, Behold, my maid Bilhah, going on her, and she shall bear upon my knees, that I may also have children by her. And she gave him to her, and gave to her, and Jacob went in unto her. And Bilhah conceived and bare Jacob a son. And Rachel said, God has judged me, and also heard my voice, and have given me a son, therefore call him Dan. Dan. Stop. We're dealing with the thing now. Chill. Verse 8. And Bilhah, Rachel's maid, conceived again, and bare Jacob a son. Second son. With great wrestling and further wrestling, I wrestled my sister. And I have a male and four of them left to me. Naphtali. How many sons that is? Two. No, all together? Six. Five. Six. All right, four and two, six. Verse nine. And when Leah saw that she had left Barry, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her to Jacob to wife. And Zilpah left her And Leah said, A troop cometh, and she called his name Gad. And Leah said, Happy am I, for daughters will call me blessed. And she called his name Asher. And she said unto her, Is it a small matter that thou hast taken my husband? <laughs> And when his daughter taken away my son's mandrakes also, and Rachel said, Therefore, he shall lie with me tonight for thy son's mandrakes. And Jacob came out and feared him, and Leah went out to meet him, and said, Thou hast come here unto me, for surely I can hide thee with my son's mandrakes. And Jacob, and God hearkened unto Leah, and she conceived and bare Jacob the fifth son. And Leah conceived again and bear Jacob the sixth son. And Leah said, Now will my husband draw me because I have born a sixth son. And she called his name Zebedee. And afterwards she bare a daughter and called her name Dinah. And God remembered Rachel, and God talked to her, and opened the womb. And she conceived and bare a son, and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. Now she she is in faith now believing that she's going to have another son. So up to this point in time, how many sons did Jacob have? Twelve. Eleven. One more to be born, and that would be who? Benjamin. Benjamin. That would be born to Rachel, and in his birth, she died. Difficult pregnancy. Well, it, it appears that she would have had uh, reproductive problems from early, and this one turned out to be fit in, in delivering. She paid the ultimate price as a mother. Jacob was trying to have, well, whenever you depart <laughs> from the will of the Lord, you're going to have problems. All right? As deception comes in, you're going to have problems. So you hear, you hear Leah? Yeah, yes, that is why you took my husband. You're going to carry my magic stuff. 
Yeah, yeah that, that is human nature. Yeah. Come on, there's nothing new under the sun. We think that there's something I was going to do. No, there's nothing new under the sun. You, you come and you took my husband. I know you come and take my son's mind. Who are you? So there were problems in this family from the upset because of the deception that was practiced and from the basis upon which it started. Mm -hmm. Now we have 11 sons thus far. One more to be born to make 12. 12 sons. How many different wives? Four, Four wives. Four different wives. Is this the divine order? No. no. Out of this piece of, let me put it nicely, confusion. God is going to gather the 12 tribes of Israel. Wow. Right? Out of this piece of confusion, and let me say nastiness, God is going to gather the 12 tribes of Israel, and people can make it all kinds of monkey fuss about which tribe we belong, supposed to belong to, when that was not the divine order. All right? It was not the divine order for Jacob to have all of these wives. And people want to make a lot of fuss about how can you be so pure when the very foundation of the thing is in peace of immorality? <laughs> Jacob was having a field there. For whatever words you went, this one gave trouble going next one. I don't give trouble one in two, I'm busy. What chances are one in four you have somebody that ain't a bad mood? In God good? Out of this. No, the thing is it's more about when we start today. Now, out of this, what we're looking at. You have 12 sons from four different wives. And out of this, God is going to achieve his purpose. Mm -hmm. Now, we are told in Revelation 14, when the love prayer message goes forth, people will be gathered from every nation, kindred, town, people. How many? Four. And Jacob's children came from here? Four different wives. So we have to look at this from God's point of view and knock out. The, the genealogical um, aspect of it because if you look at that, you can look at the Israelites and say, Listen, don't tell me anything about y'all being God's people. Mm -hmm. you, you see how y'all you, you ever check your beginning? Mm -hmm. Um, there was there is a text, I'm trying to remember it, and the Lord has said to them that your father was a Syrian and your mother was an Egyptian or something like that. I'm trying to see if I can remember, find that text and I'll come back to you with it. Where the Lord was identifying to them, their beginnings, and there was nothing about it that they should be proud of. Because the Pharisees in their day and age, they would say, we be Abraham's seven. And forget that true Abraham came, Isaac, and true Isaac came, Jacob, and Jacob had four different wives to get the twelve tribes from, and they were looking at Jesus and telling him, we be not born of fornication. All they were born of fornication. You know what I said to Jesus? We be not born of fornication. And Jesus could have said, look, if you knew your history, you would know that all y'all come with a fornication. Four different wives, 12 different tribes, all mixed up, all along the line. Six from him, two for one I made, two from the other I made, and two for the other one. All mixed up, immorality and stuff, and they're now making noise and arguing, but we be the children of Israel. And when you check to see, the history and beginning ain't nothing to be proud of. But it says to us that we cannot let any background interfere with our being a part of God's people. God will take the worst situation and out of it bring something to his honor and glory. This is God's purpose, his internal purpose. He will take the same problem that should not have developed and out of it he will achieve his purpose. So we don't have to worry about our background, our culture, our education. The circumstances of our perception, these have nothing to do with God's purpose. Amen. All right, and out of that, out of all the things that will exist, when the Lord is finished, when He's ready to produce the 144,000, they will come from all kinds of backgrounds Amen. every nation, kindred, town, and people. And Jacob had four different women, out of which he got his 12 Tribe. children, the 12 tribes of Israel. And if you listen to the Pharisees thinking and talking, you would think that Jacob had one wife. And got all of his children from it, one ideal relationship and marriage as God intended to be. We are to learn from that. That when it comes to being a child of God, background, circumstances, education, culture have nothing to do with God's will. In God's eternal purpose, He's going to have some of the worst people on the planet 
in the other 44,000 and some of the quote unquote best people on the planet are not going to make it because they're not going to see themselves as the Lord will see them and not allow the Lord to bring them to where he wants them to be. So here you have I just want to make read, read on Benjamin and then we will open up for questions. We'll go to um we'll go to the, the tribes next time. Now in Russia, where is Russia and born giving birth to um Benjamin? I had it here just a little bit on. Thank you. I accept the fact that no worries there. Yes. Thank you. Or give me a minute, brother. Just to bring in 35, 15. <clears throat> right, verse 16. Um, Genesis 35, 16 to 20. And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephraim, Ephra, and Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass that when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, when his father called his name Benjamin. And Rachel died, and was buried in the way of Ephra, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave. That is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. And the two words, Benoni, that is the son of my sorrow, and Benjamin, that is the son of my old age. So she named him one day, son of my sorrow, because it cost her her life. He named him son of my old age. And that was his final son that was, that was born to him. That was selfish from your point of view here. But he, as a man in his old age, could rejoice, but the price was very high for that 12 son, which was say to us, it says to us that in the achievement of his purpose, is going to cost God a lot. All right, it cost the Godhead a tremendous amount to achieve this divine purpose. They had to pay a tremendous price. We're not the only ones who suffer in this controversy and who have hard things to bear. The Godhead endured some severe trials in order to achieve God's purpose. These are the 12 sons of Jacob, out of whom the 12 tribes of Israel came, out of whom God will have his final body of believers. We will get to Jacob and Israel and the 12 tribes as we move on in our studies, just laying the foundation in the background so we can understand when it comes to the end time, we don't need to be a part of any particular tribe, of any particular race or nation. According to God's purpose, he said, you will be gathered from every nation, kindred, town and people. You don't need to be a literal Israelite. As a matter of fact, we look at what Israel means, how Jacob became Israel, and identify then how God's true Israel will be and where they will come from so we don't have to be led astray by people who come around believing that since it says Israel, you must know which Israel you are. And there are even Adventists who believe that it is literal Israel and that we are not going to be part of the identified for them. Forgetting that probation clause for little Israel since 8034. Oh. You have to take the principles in the word of God and go with principles and don't let culture and education and beliefs that are not founded in God's word be the basis for your beliefs and the position that you take. There will be many things that will come up. We need to have a dust safe the Lord to be solidly grounded on.
to be able to deal with these things because they're going to come up. And a lawyer might come and ask you to be a, a crisis. How do you know that you're part of this song because it says the 12 tribes of Israel? We're part of Israel, you're from. And there are many people that call themselves Israel today that are no more Israelite than I am. Because if you're born here, you're an Israelite, you're American. Okay? But they use that conveniently. And God wants us to know the truth so we can escape the error and the deceptions that will come because there are going to be many deceptions that will be presented all over the world come crisis time when we get to that. And we will look some more at that background when we move on and we continue on to build up towards 104,000. Bear it in mind, keeping it in mind because you will need to have that understanding to be able to escape many of the things that are said and done in this day and age concerning the 144. So, all right, questions, comments before we um, pray. Sister Alison. I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but I have serious issues when it comes to, you said, don't talk about the background of the people. Wait one second. You know, um, my issue is that I don't you're racist? Yes, I'm racist. When I look at the, the plight of blacks, of black people from far back and the, the hundreds of years of slavery, when I look at the history and how the people that they call Jews have been compensated for what have been done um, to them, when I look at the Indians that have been compensated and the blacks are uh, over 20 million, more than the amount of Jews that were killed, than blacks, more blacks were killed than Jews than Indians put together. And when I look at all of that and I still see the elements of racism, it's so hard for me to accept white people, knowing that they feel superior, they act, and they feel in the mind superior to black people. I, I, I know, I know, it's not supposed to think like that, but I have an issue with that because I work in it every day and I see it every day, so it's, it's something that needs to be touch for me. That is exactly where the Lord placed you in. <laughs> no, no, you're laughing. Any issue that we have, listen, you can't take that to heaven. Let me ask you this question. If you are translated and Jesus turns out to be white, what are you going to do? I can't see you as a white. No, I ask you that. You know, you know how it is. I just asked you a simple question. If you get translated and Jesus turns out to be white, what are you going to do? You're going to leave heaven. No, 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 no. You're going to leave heaven because I cannot believe how you, a white man, a white girl, I can allow these white people to unfair black people so long and come tell me that you don't. I want to get out of here right now. You won't think like that, she'll be already come for <laughs> that's, that's just, yeah, you can give her a nice day. But no, I'll just be there with her answers tomorrow. Now, listen, do we, in a certain way, so what? Relax. In a certain way, if slavery had not developed, you know the majority of us would not be in existence. Oh yeah. It is the moving of Africans from Africa through America, through the Caribbean, that is where all the Caribbean countries are basically descended from. You have some from Spanish and some from the Caribs and the Iraqs, etc. But the majority of, to be politically correct, African Americans came out of the slavery trade. And that is to be a source of encouragement to us that in spite of that evil of slavery, Something. God is going to gather people yeah. into his eternal purpose. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right? God is going to gather us into his eternal purpose. Not only look at the, the situation with Jacob and stuff, but our situation in slavery, etc., because that was not a God. God never intended any in single, single individual to be enslaved. That is sin working out. So when you are looking at it, don't look at black and white. Look at the same problem. And know beyond that, that the real issue here is not skin color, but the principle of sin that exists. <coughs> because God has made of one blood all nations of men for the dwell upon the earth. A person thinking that they're betting you because the skin color is lighter is irrelevant to the great controversy because the person that, whatever skin color you are, you still got to breathe here, like me. I can breathe the same air. Oh and you can't stop it. You have to eat food like me. You might eat a different deck because you have a different cost or you got more money. And you go to the bathroom like me. No problem. That is, that is his problem. You, as a child of God, 
are not to let discrimination be a part of your character experience. God is not going to convert this world. Jesus lived under the Roman government, and they were grinding oppression, she said, but he never attempted any civil reforms. And when he said to the disciples, when they bid you go one night, go train, the disciples had a hard time with it because Rome was ruling the world, and every Roman citizen was superior to every Jewish citizen because they were in servitude. And if a Roman going on the road had his goods to carry, see a Jew, you take up my goods. And if you ain't carrying it, licks in your skin, or get arrested. Jesus said, when they tell go money, go to sacrifice. He's going to come to the glory from me. He's going to put it in verse. How do we get him? We're going to get him. And the disciples said to Jesus, these are some hard things that you are bringing. So when he outlined the principles of the government of God in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, my father said, well, you, you, you can't be no more that. You come to make our burden worse than it was. He said, you come to deliver from Rome. You come to put us in a great history. As soon as we get the first opportunity, we're going to kill you. Are you going to use those? Those were the principles that they were looking for. Earthly deliverance Christ was bringing to them. The principles of the government of God. Then Pilate said to him, Don't you know that I can de deliver you? Jesus said, Look, You can have no power over me except be given you from above. You're not bothering me. Jesus was resting his father. You can have no power over me except be given you from above. So he was thinking that he was better than Jesus, but Jesus was relaxed. And as Ellen White said, in the whole audience, the only person that was at peace was Jesus. And when he looked at this criminal, she said he was vexed to, to bring the come away, came up early to judge in this case. And she said he come up to deal with this criminal with magisterial severity. That's the phrase she used. Magisterial severity. He can dismiss this case and condemn one time and done with that. She come up and look at the criminal. He looked at many criminals before. There's nothing about this man as a criminal. Look at everybody else. The only innocent person there was him. And Paula could not deal with that case with any magisterial severity. It is simply because of the character of God that was in him that caused him to stop. So when your white oppressors are coming over to you, don't let them see blackness coming up. Let them see the divine character revealing God to affect a change in them. And God going to say black, white, Indian, Syrian, Chinese, Illusion, Barbados, Jamaica, all together. And when we finish, as Paul picks it up, in Christ, we need a bond, no free. Barbarian, Scythian, black, white, male, female. no female. So when it comes to Christ, those cultural things do not have a bearing. When you are here in the church of God, you are a child of God, and God is not concerned with your gender. Your gender comes to play when you go home and you beg your wife. Make sure that your husband is a man and your wife is a woman. As you always your gender is coming to But when it comes to the work of God, God has nothing. God has nothing to do with gender. Okay? When we are in the body of Christ, male and female is a relative. But that the Lord pays you there for your sanctification maturity. Sister Maria. I see on this subject with the wife. Um as in at that time, the Jews had nothing to do with the Samaritans. The Romans were, um, they were under bondage. What color were they all? Basically the same color. Right. So then they didn't look in that color at that time. But there was still discrimination. See, no, there was still discrimination, even though there was no color because of the race you were from. And both those were from Abraham. You know. But there was still discrimination among them because oh, yes, um, of that culture. Yes. Because and, they were Samaritan and Jews. So and Jews. And Jesus had a hard time with the disciples because of that same kind of prejudice that is on Christ's life has to come up. And Jesus took them to Samaria for three days. And it was much uncomfortable, very uncomfortable there for those three days. Jesus was teaching them the principles of God's government. He does not respect these things. And God's grace flows to every single person. Sorry, Phoenician, Greek, Samaritan. Barbarian, whoever Jesus dealt with all people on the same level because love of the love of God is no respecter of persons. They had to be delivered from that. The color is the result of the sin problem. The sin has exaggerated these colors, but God is God of red. So Esau was when it said Edom, the margin says red. The original color of mankind was red. When I was made from the dust of the ground. He was red. He was red. Either white or black. He was red according to the clay, the color of the earth. He was red. No. You see, the blacks will say that God is black and the 
You want to say that God is what the Chinese say that God is a Chinese, everybody will, instead of trying to find out who God is and get like him, everybody want to make God like them. Yes. Because when you have a God like you, that means you don't have to change. All right? But God made him from the dust of the ground. Adam was red. Adam, man, he was red. He neither white nor black. Red. These variations are the exaggerations of the same problem. The collapse of the so <laughs> you know racist tomorrow. My thing is the response to I'm not knowing what the answer is. Not Agnes. Alison. Okay. So it's Alison. It's on the standard of our Indian races. <laughs> I I can give you a scenario that happened to me Friday while the was you know something happened. All right, my surgeon decided that it wanted to give me trouble, and I ended up going to my to the store I teach crochet at. Right, I work there teaching crochet. The owners are Jewish, right? A Jewish family. However, I am advertising a workshop. I asked, why is it that all of the other workshops that the Jewish women teach have a big poster <laughs> and mine doesn't? Do you want to know the response I got? Because I was not Jewish. That's what I was told. They thought that I was going to get upset because I you know, they told me that, and they too on top of that, I'm black. You know what's the weirdest thing? Because I'm not Jewish, and because I'm black, my class is the most popular in the store. And I always have new students coming in every single day, three to sometimes five. Sometimes I have 10 students going around at the same time. You see what I mean? So, the owner is baffled to him, is baffling him that here I am. He wanted me to come and teach on a Saturday. You know what I told him? I'm an Adventist. I worship on Saturdays. His mouth hit the floor. Now you see the difference. Now I could have called him all types of things and throw the Bible at him and say, oh, you're nothing but a racist Jew. That's why most of y'all get killed out in Egypt and all of that. I could have said all of that. But because I chose to keep my mouth shut, see my blessing? So just, I mean, I can tell you, honestly, it was hard as hell to let it roll off my back before. <clears throat> But with God's grace, I learned to let things go. Amen. Wherever we are, wherever we need, let it go. What our what our, our fault is, God is going to place us in the right mm -hmm. circumstances mm -hmm. to give us the victory over it. Because you can't take it to heaven, so you got you got got, got rid of it. You got has to be got rid of. No, Sister Kirk. I read the genealogy here in um, Genesis 25, 20, It says, "I have Oh, yeah, the Syrian of Pharaoh and Aaron, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. How is that related? Oh, explain that relationship with Abraham, because I know Abraham was converted all the Chinese. And then Syria was Lebanon. So how was that genealogy connected to us? They, Abraham were early Chinese, and he came to, the Lord, he ensured land, take him to a land, and he came into the promised land, which would be and they were related. How far back um, it goes is not fully clear to me right now. But obviously they were re related because Laban and Rachel were brother and sister. Right. And Rachel was his daughter. And Jacob would be the daughter of his sister. Because Rachel was Laban's sister. Jacob was Sarah Rebecca was Laban's sister and Jacob was Rebecca's son. Rachel was Laban's daughter. So they were related. Obviously going back in the genealogy, but they were related. And they were no marvel because Sarah was Abraham's sister too. In that culture it was still fairly safe 
to be marrying that close. Now, it is dangerous because of the weakness of the race yes. and the degeneration and the transmission of disease and stuff. Via the genetic coding, it is in a, unadvisable to marry that close into your family. Back then, with the strength and the purity of the race, it was not uh, that detrimental. But now it, it is. And the Lord has given commands to Israel not to do that. And you find families and races that do that tend to have problems when they want to marry into their own kind. And stay with that. But it degenerates the race over a period of time. And because they believe that we are pure and should not be mixed. And it's rubbish. All of us possess the same sinful fallen nature. And if you disobey the word of God, the consequences are going to be felt in the families and in the children because that will degenerate the race. The gene pool is to spread it. You don't need all of that. Just stick to the word of God. God gave them advice how to operate, not to do that, but they stick with it and you limit the gene pool and it should be a spreading out and an intermixing and going along. It should be according to the will of God. God knows what he's saying. When he says something, his infinite wisdom is protecting us from dangers and perils that would follow as a result of what he forbids. If we obey, the benefits are there. If we disobey, the curses and the consequences will follow. All right. 820. Any other questions or comments? We'll close with the word of the season of prayer. And we'll press on a little further on next week, looking at the 140 to 4,000. Start at the beginning and come across to the end because we need to understand it and we will better, clear, better comprehend what the Lord needs when He says 144,000. Let us pray.